welcome to your colleagues. Thank you for coming. It's a big day for us in the lead up to Reconciliation Day 16 December, where normally this time of year we take stock on the temperature of the nation. From 2003, the Institute has been doing this work. And, um, you know, just from all the debates we've had recently around the racial attacks in Cape Town, um, you know, to this year of reflection after Madiba's passing, that should have been a year of consolidation and reflection, which in fact became a year of fragmentation. Uh, if we look at the labor movement, we look at uh, business, uh, formal business organizations, we look at parliament across the street, it's been a year of incredible fragmentation. Um, in, in this whole climate, I think it's very important that we are also take a sober stance and stock of what is in fact happening. And that is why we are glad to put forward this report. Because we do actually believe that these uh, figures that we present to you in this report are accurate. That they do reflect reality on the ground. Um, I say so for a number of reasons. The first reason is that this is, this is a report that has been running for, for 10 years now. So it's tried and tested. The, the data is all available online and it's, be, it's being analyzed by scholars right around the world. The second is we, we are very confident that the sample that, uh, that this is based on is a very good and well stratified sample of about 3,500, between 3,500 and 4,000 individuals across South Africa uh, selected uh, randomly on the basis of their race, their gender, their age, their geography, where they live in the country, um, etc., etc. All these things are taken into account when this uh, survey goes out. It's a comprehensive survey. And the final point, I think, why we think this is a good survey is because there's a lot of theory and theorizing and thinking that goes into making the survey happen. So we have, for example, five <coughs> hypotheses that we say, if these five things happen, we think reconciliation <coughs> is on the up. And, and, and so, so I, I put this proudly forward to you. This year, however, this report is not based on a survey done in 2014. This is a, a report that looks back over the whole 10 years and says, what are the trends over the last 10 years in the South African population? And I think Kim has done a fantastic job of writing this up into a readable, easy to, to follow report. And it's also not a tomb. You can see here it's quite thin. You can read it through quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing I wanted to just say to you today is, um, if we look at these stats that we've, that we've analyzed over the last 10 years, it strikes me that reconciliation works in different directions. And the one area where we see regression, with other words, going backwards, is reconciliation upward. That means towards our political leadership and also to this idea, lofty idea of, of South Africa's unified nation. That th seems to be slipping, and, and Kim will be talking more in depth about that. Also, reconciliation backwards, in other words, with our own past, seems to be regressing. Why do I say that? South Africans are less and less likely to admit that apartheid was a crime against humanity, as time goes. And that's worrying. You know, that is not surprising that in that vacuum of forgetfulness, you get a Steve Hofmeyer coming in and saying the kinds of ridiculous things that he is saying. Or that you have perhaps new romantic historians in the ANC that will put a whole new spin on, on our history. It's very important for us as a nation to, rem to remember accurately of in fact what had happened in the past. And that apartheid was in fact a crime against humanity declared in 1971, I think, by the United Nations, or 74. So, so that Reconciliation backwards we worried about. The one bit of good news I think that is coming out for me at least is the reconciliation horizontally between black and white South Africans. But only if you have a job. And, and that reconciliation uh, is twice as likely today to happen as 10 years ago. In other words, you're twice as likely to get to know a black South African or a white South African in a formal setting than you, as you were 10 years ago. 
that is good news. That's very good news. And that's the silent work of ongoing reconciliation. But, that, but the big caveat there is only if you have a job. In that engagement, I think we should not be surprised then if, if South Africans are beginning to now ask very hard, tough questions about race. So what does it mean to be white? Have historical privilege. How do we live with this thing called the privilege of having been on the receiving end of apartheid's injustice? On the other hand, what does black em uh, empowerment really mean? <clears throat> what does it mean to be colored and to, or to take on that identity and feel that you may be isolated or vulnerable in between these other groups? These are questions people are asking at the moment. I just think it's very important we don't cede that territory to the hotheads in our society, but that we as, as rational South Africans that have learn, are learning to live together that we base what we say on a certain amount of factual information and that we then take the middle ground in this conversation and make sure that the gains of the past uh, 10, 15 years are not lost. In a time that's a very difficult time for our nation right now, where we're doubting ourselves a little bit. So I think that, that is sort of the, the takeaway that I have from this report. I must say, uh, I think it's a, it's a very good read. I just want to say that again. And I do encourage you all to engage with the report as the uh, day wears on. This year's report is entitled Reflecting on Reconciliation. And um, it's been a year of reflection for the Saab in more than one way. On the one hand, we've devoted the report to reflecting on 11 years of data. On the other hand, we've spent a lot of time researching what reconciliation actually means to South Africa. 20 years into democracy in order to revamp the survey instrument. So we haven't collected data this year because we've, we've put the time and energy into doing research in order to create a survey instrument that is relevant going forward. Um, it's a very important year for us celebrating 20 years of democracy and on Friday we celebrate the legacy of a national and international icon of reconciliation. It's also, as Fani was pointing out, a time when the contradictions and the issues are rising to the surface, and a time where we're forced to, to look at South Africa very maturely in order to celebrate what we've gained, but also to ask the hard questions about where we still need to go moving forward. A metaphor that's been really helpful in interpreting the results and the different direction of the results, as Fani explained, um, is the metaphor of light and shadow. And it's almost as if as we progress in some areas of reconciliation and the light shines in those areas, so we are more able to see the shadows that continue to exist from our history that we still need to confront and deal with. So a quote from the Saab that, that speaks to this metaphor is that progress in reconciliation cannot be assessed in a simple linear fashion. Instead, it seems that the light cast in the spaces where we improve in reconciliation pushes us yet further to engage with and transform the shadows cast by our shared histories of oppression and violence. Okay, Fani commented on the methodology. Um, as he said, we have a so sample size of about 3,500 South Africans each year. The sample is chosen using um, st statistical methods which ensure that um, the, the people that we interview are representative of the broader South African society so that we can say that our results are reflective of South Africa more generally. We analyze these results in terms of different demographic variables, including gender, age, race, class. But what we find is that the variables that really make a difference are race and class. When we analyze it in terms of gender and age, we don't see that much of a difference in terms of perceptions of reconciliation. But when we analyze it in terms of race, um, there are still some, some big differences in perceptions and experiences of reconciliation. And um, just to be clear, we, we use old apartheid categories of race because these categories had material, symbolic, structural effects on South Africans. Not because we believe these categories exist in reality, but they exist because of the way they were set into to motion during apartheid. And until 
they cease to affect the lives of South Africans, we still need to measure things in terms of them so we can understand where, where, we, where we're doing better and where we, where we still have work to do. And then class is measured in terms of something called the living standard measure, which is a, a measure of South Africans' living standard. And um, respondents are giving a, given a category between 1 and 10, with 1 representing the poorest South Africans and 10 representing the wealthiest South Africans. Okay, so the first set of findings that I want to present to you is on political culture and specifically on questions of South African identity. Because as Swani was saying, um, there is a, a decrease in the desire for a united South Africa that we find in the results. And when we read that alongside some other results, it seems as if South Africans are coming to a more complex understanding of what it means to be South African. And they're no longer buying into this idea of unity and equality and homogeneity in a context where we still face so much inequality, where people have very different lived experiences. Um, this, this idea of unity is no longer ho holding sway for South Africans. So a quote which, which represents this finding is, um, a decreasing desire for a united South African identity may indicate a more critical evaluation about what is meant by a unified identity. So the first set of findings um, that speak to this is, are represented in figure one. What I want to point your attention to in this figure is the blue line on the graph. On the vertical axis, you have the percentage of South Africans who agree that a united South Africa is desirable and possible. And on the horizontal axis, you have time. So looking at how this level of agreement changed over time. The blue line represents the percentage of South Africans who say a united South African is desirable. And from 2003, it was around 73%. And by 2013, it had decreased to 55%. So that's about an 18% decrease over time in the amount of South Africans who agree that a united South Africa is desirable. OK, alongside this, when we ask South Africans which identities they associate most strongly with, and we give them a list of 13 possibilities, this graph in figure two, shows you the top four possibilities chosen by South Africans over time. The two that I want to point your attention to are the green line, which is the percentage of South Africans who say that a South African nationality is their strongest identity, and then the orange line, which is the percentage of South Africans that say that race is, a, is their strongest identity. And while South African nationality has decreased over time, race has increased over time. So it's moved from the third most chosen to the second most chosen um, identity association. To add to the story, a seemingly contradictory finding in terms of these findings is that interracial trust is improving. So even though race is increasing as a, um, an identity chosen by South Africans as their most important identity, interracial trust is improving. And you might think that as trust improves, race is going to become less important. And the figure that, that demonstrates the results that interracial trust is improving is when South Africans are, are asked whether they agree with the statement, people of other races are untrustworthy. In 2003, over 40% agreed with this. In 2013, under 30% agreed with this. So it was a 10% decrease in the percentage of South Africans who say other race groups are untrustworthy. In other words, interracial trust is improving. So how do we interpret these seemingly contradictory results that as interracial trust improves, the importance of racial identity also improves, and a desire for unity seems to have decreased? Um, one possibility, one possible interpretation is that with increased trust in relationships, this often also brings increased honesty and confrontation with the shadows that continue to exist there. Quoting from the Saab, the decreasing desire for a united South Africa and the increasing identification with racial identity possibly opens up the space to move towards a shared identity of transformation, which is based in engaging difference, power and conflict, rather than assimilation and unity based in denying difference, power, and conflict. So perhaps with increased trust, 
we're more able to speak about the race issues. Race is becoming more important because we're more able to talk about the way that it still matters in South Africa and the issues that still exist around it. Okay, so now moving to findings on racial integration and class inequality. One of the major findings of the Saab over the years has been the extent to which class inequality is a key mediating factor as far as racial integration is concerned. Okay, I will explain this with the stats and I have infographics for you. Interracial socializing has improved. We ask South Africans how often they speak to someone from another race in a social setting. And the social setting is important because it's in social settings that you connect with people. And you you're able to understand their lived experience and it's more intimate than just in an everyday at the shops on the streets. So how many South Africans report often or always socializing with someone from another race? In 2003, it was about 10% or one in every 10 South Africans. In 2013, this is more than doubled to 24% or 2.4 in every 10 South Africans. However, the poor remain excluded from this. This infographic shows you the analysis of the same question by class or by LSM. So the green men represent the poorest South Africans in the lowest LSM groups. The purple men represent the middle income South Africans. And the pink men represent the wealthiest South Africans. And f for each colored in man um, or woman, <laughs> this is how many within that group say that they often or always socialize with other race groups. So what you can see is in the lowest LSM groups, this is a lot less than in the middle, and in the higher LSM groups, it's, it's the highest. And um, it seems to be increasing more for the higher LSM groups, so that the gap between the amount of South Africans that socialize in the lower LSM groups and the amount of South Africans that socialize in the higher LSM groups is getting bigger rather than smaller over time. So the poor are excluded from this positive result and over time this is not improving. Okay, a final set of findings, sorry, it's actually the second last set of findings, is on memory politics. And the reason that I say memory politics is to capture the link between memory, how we remember the past, and what we do in the present. So it's politics not in the, just in the sense of kind of political parties, but in the broader sense of what kind of change is possible in South African society, and whether the way that we remember allows us to continue to change the kinds of inequality set up during apartheid, or whether it closes down the space to make these changes. And a quote from Milan Kundera, his novel, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, really brings together this memory and politics, this intersection between memory and politics. The struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. So this is very relevant for us when we think about um, the results on whether or not South Africans agree that apartheid was a criminal and unjust system. And across these results, we're finding that South Africans are less likely to agree 11 years on than they were in 2003. One of the um, results that, that shows this is on the question of whether South Africans agree that apartheid was a crime against humanity. In 2003, 86.5% of South Africans agreed. In 2013, this has dropped by 10%. I just also want to point out here that um, the response categories given to South Africans are strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. So what you're seeing here is the amount of th South Africans that say agree and strongly agree. So there's still a neutral. So you can't minus it from 100 in order to get the disagreement. Okay, I just want to, just in case that it looks like that, that's not, it's just the agreement figure. What's even more concerning is when we analyze the same question by race, in 2013, white South Africans were significantly less likely than other South Africans to agree that apartheid was a crime against humanity. Just over half of white South Africans agree with the statement, compared to about eight in every 10 Asian, Indian, and black South African, and about seven in every 10 colored South African. This is significant because in terms of acknowledging the legacy of apartheid, the unjust and criminal nature of apartheid, for black South Africans in the general sense, 
they know this injustice. It's in their lived experience. It's in their family history. They lived it, their, family their, their families lived it. White South Africans don't know this. They were, they were privileged by apartheid. So it's very important that white South Africans, as, a, as an identity group, come to the awareness around the nature of injustice and the fact that they are less likely to remember has serious implications for relationships of reconciliation. So it's speaking to this issue of identity politics, and identity politics have really risen to the surface of the Saab, and we speak to a whole lot of different racial identities. But for this presentation, I decided to focus on white identity. Because of the recent racism and race attacks that the media have covered, and um, the concerning nature of these, I wanted to spend a bit of time thinking about what insights the Saab can give us where, where have we improved? But where do we still have work to do, especially when it comes to white identity? And um, findings indicate that there's a real need to engage white South Africans on the question of what their whiteness means for them and educate young South Africans about the relevance of the past for the present. Right? As I was saying before, different, different racial identities hold different places in relationships of power and different experiences of history. They're differently implicated in history. So we can't expect the same responsibilities from different racial identities in the reconciliation equation. Um, for, for white South Africans who benefited from apartheid, they do bear a responsibility to acknowledge the injustice that they benefited from in a different way to the responsibilities held by black South Africans generally in the reconciliation equation. So what do the findings tell us about white South Africans in relation to reconciliation. A positive finding is that their support for racial integration has improved over the past 11 years. Um, I want to point your attention to the white line, which is the percentage of white South Africans, sorry, not the white line, the blue line, which is the percentage of white South Africans who agree, um, who, who approve of relatives interracial marriage. And um, what it's showing us is that this was very low in 2003. It was only 13.1% of white South Africans who approved with um, a relative uh, marrying someone from another race. But by 2013, this has increased to 35.1%. So we're improving in terms of white identity and racial integration. And this is something that I like to think of as non-racialism. We're improving in terms of non-racialism, that kind of race doesn't matter for things like marriage and, um, and, and, int and intimate um, relationships. However, where we're not improving, where we're regressing in terms of white identity, is the denial of historical injustice. And this is where I think a key clue lies in terms of where we need to go in the future if we want to seriously address continued racism in South Africa. So as I've showed you, the quantitative research shows that white South Africans are significantly less likely to agree that apartheid was a crime against humanity than the rest of South Africans. We also did in-depth qualitative research in 2011, and the focus group findings for white South Africans showed a strong sense of defensiveness around white identity and acknowledging apartheid. So a few quotes from this research, but I'm not going to apologize for being white. I don't feel I need to reconcile with anyone because I didn't do anything. Leave apartheid out of the history books. Ignorance is bliss, hey, and apartheid has nothing to do with me. So looking at our quantitative and qualitative findings together, even though there's an increase in support for interracial integration and non-racialism, there's an inability to acknowledge the historical injustice of the past and take responsibility. So a, um, a proposal. From, from these results in terms of understanding where we are and where we need to go, is a suggestion that we've done quite well in terms of non-racialism. Perhaps we now need to move to identities of anti-racism anti that, that actively acknowledge and address racism that continues in society, both the covert forms, the forms that don't quite look like racism but are acting subtly, and the overt forms that we have seen more recently in terms of um, violent race attacks. So we see an increase in support for racial integration and the development of a non-racial identity for white South Africans, but a decrease in awareness of legacies of racism and historical injustice and a lack of willingness to engage with legacies of oppression. 
Results challenge reconciliation to move beyond non-racialism towards building anti-racist South African identity, which actively challenges covert and overt racism in society. Okay, so just to bring the findings together and summarize them, we saw South Africans are disillusioned with claims to unity. There's an increase in interracial trust. This is positive for reconciliation alongside a strengthening of racial identi identity. So potentially people are becoming more willing and able to, to address some of the, the hard issues. Um, racial integration has improved for the wealthy. This is positive for reconciliation, but the poor are increasingly excluded. So we need to ask what kinds of interventions are needed here. Forgetting the oppressive and criminal nature of apartheid is um, not so good for reconciliation because if we don't remember the legacy of our, par our past, we're not going to continue to change it in the present and we're also at risk of repeating it. And finally, it seems like white South Africans are willing to support racial integration but less willing to acknowledge racial injustice. And if we want to deal with racism going forward, it is a suggestion that perhaps we need to take on issues of um, creating anti-racist identity. Final quote that um, brings it together from the Saab. It is only by creating a collective awareness of the tensions and inequalities which continue to exist that we can come to shape a shared identity based on principles of justice, transformation, and anti-racism, rather than assimilation, unity, and non-racialism. What, what we've seen also sort of in terms of, of people's sort of sense of identity. Um, you know, uh, we, we, in the survey there has been a number of questions that really sort of probe how people see themselves in what, what grouping they, they belong. And um, what, what we've seen is, is, for example, that sort of exclusive identities like um, your, your language identity sort of comes out to usually on top. Um, followed by racial identity, ethnic uh, sort of identity, and then sort of only sort of in the fourth place or so, it, it is the the sort of the national identity, the South African national identity. Is it a bad thing? Um, I, I think um, you know if if one thinks about the discourse over, over the past sort of twenty years, um, we as South Africans have always sort of um, envisioned a society that that should be. Uh, one society that, that uh, or we had the romantic notion of everybody being assimilated into one uh, generic sort of culture, but I think also as a nature or as a nation, we are maturing, also recognizing that a, a nation can also exist um, as as a, a combination of, of different cultures, languages, etc. And there is tolerance uh, for that because that that is one of the findings that we also see. The, the, the lowering in the levels of, of distrust that, that exists between the people. So I, I think one, one can uh, interpret it positively in the sense that, that it's, it's um, also sort of an increase in the tolerance that, that exists between people and also an acceptance of this, this diversity that we do not necessarily have to be assimilated in one homogenous culture, but that, that we are a country of, of, of diversity. Coming out of a history where you know race was used to divide, language groups were used to divide, and so the caution there is really that once people start to retreat into these traditional identities of race and language groupings, mm -hmm. there is that risk that um, you know politicians in particular will will you know be tempted to want to leverage this um, you know this kind of development for political gain. If you look at our electoral politics already, mm -hmm. that we see the racial polarization and it's very, <coughs> very easy to actually ignite those kind of, of, of past divisions uh, as we go forward into South Africa. So there has to be a caution around how we're developing as a nation. And I think for for reconciliation, unity a sense of, uh, of recognizing each other's humanity is quite mm -hmm. crucial. Yeah, what's the link between one society and one political unit? You know, so, so, so I mean, what we are seeing is that there's a decline in trust in government, in parliament, in the president. The president's office has been in free fall over the last years in terms of trust. <coughs> and these are the... Is that in the report, sorry? 
Yeah, yeah. There's in, in political culture, there's suffer on decreasing that. trust. So, so you know, so that means that the symbols of the political unity, the symbols of the unified political entity called South Africa. They are being less and less trusted by South Africans. That's an early warning sign, I would think, of, of stability. And one has to take that seriously. And ask the question then, um, you know, I, I agree with Jan that there's more realism about whether or not we're going to be one society soon. It doesn't seem like that. And as long as it, that doesn't mean, by the way, that we've made peace with poverty, and that we will have a permanent underbelly in society, and that's okay, because it's not. Um, but on the political front, you know, the cost, the opportunity cost of discredited political leaders in office is becoming clear to us, statistically. It means that there is a huge cost to South Africa in terms of the credibility of the democratic institutions because of the inhabitants of those offices. Uh, and, and unless, you know, they are seen to actually uh, do what they're supposed to do in office, uh, you know, this has an impact on what ordinary South Africans think and feel about the democratic institutions of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so that trust is coming down. And, and that, I think, so, so I just want to make that link as well, and, and because that's an interesting difference. I think that the ideal of a rainbow nation, that's one thing. We be more sober about that, but when we start doubting our democratic institutions, we're in real trouble. I think in general, there's been a decrease in um, the agreement that apartheid was a crime against humanity, and I think it speaks to how we teach history and how we remember history and whether or not it is important for South Africa and South African schools to remember the legacy and the history of our past and what the implication is on that for a broader memory consciousness. Um, it's not 20% who don't, sorry, just to go back to the stats. So this again, this is agreement, then there'll be a figure for neutral and a figure for disagreement. So not, it, it's not 20% who disagree, it's 20% covered by neutral and disagree. Um, and then, I'm just thinking the other question, oh, how does this speak to um, the race incidents? Because I really have t been trying to think through what the Saab can, can offer. And, um, and the findings that show that um, support for interracial relationships has improved tell, tell us that it's not, it's not just about approval for non-racialism. There's something more that's not happening, and that something more is this unwillingness to recognize the nature of racist injustice in the past and the present. And, um, and why, why, why are these attacks occurring, or are they getting more coverage? I mean, it, it's, it's positive that they're getting this coverage, and that people are, are being, being help, taken to task, because I think that for these young students to commit these acts, you imagine that at some level they think that it's okay. At some level they've been taught, they've listened to the racist jokes that go on in their families or a father saying, oh, apartheid wasn't actually so bad and got the message that, um, that it's okay. So, but that's, that, that is also me, me speculating. That's not from the results. What we have from the results is that they white South Africans are far less likely to agree that apartheid was a crime against humanity. You know, I, the key question for me is how representative are, are these incidents of the broader white psyche? Does this represent how white people actually think and feel or not? And that's a key question we need to look at further in the analysis of the, because it's easy to disown them as black, black sheep, sorry for the pun, but you mm. know, sort of, you know, um, exceptions to the rule, or is it that they actually, one, one way to look at it is to say also that this bigger interracial contact and the fact that that becomes normal, normalized now and there's more racial trust may be smoking out the racists also. You know, that this, is, this is exposing people who have not adapted 
and it's becoming increasingly difficult to hold on to, and that is a sort of the anger between that worldview and what is now becoming the predominant worldview may also generate some very deviant behavior amongst people. That's not to say this is exceptionalism. I'm, I'm just saying it may also be that these things are being smoked out. And in that case, it will be, in fact, good news for us to then confront these mm. legacies, um, as Kim says. One piece of advice is to, to, to bring in the element of power and power relations. So the fact that white South Africans benefited from apartheid um, have, have, have grown up within families that were taught to believe, apartheid taught white people to believe that they were superior to black people. So in that context, when there is an act of violence of a, white, a young white South African against a black South African, and often there are also statements to go with that, so, so what are the kinds of things that they're saying around that and what do those things represent? And they're often very dehumanizing statements. So it's not the same because the, the places which in, with, that racial identities exist within relations of power and history are different and we can't ignore that history. We can't ignore that power dynamic. These things do not happen in a vacuum. So contextualizing it helps and also um, bringing out the, the, the statements that come with the acts. And often, they're not overt racist state statements, they're covert racist statements, which is also telling, because I think covert racism is the, is the soil in which the more overt acts are fertilized. This is not an anti-white thing. This is anti-racism. And racism is an illness that just can destroy a society completely. And you see how it subtly mutates all the time in the United States, for example, with the Ferguson attacks, uh, Ferguson riots now. You know, there's just, it can be an illness that we will have in our midst for a very long time if we don't, and we can't afford it in South Africa. We've got enough other things to deal with. So, so you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, is, it is looking at what is this particular mindset mm -hmm. that we inherited, which uh, is so destructive. It pushes us to develop our humanity. I think that's, that's the, the positive side, is if we can be honest about this and we can properly engage with the imp implications of our legacy and build relationships of humanity despite this legacy, it, it enables an increasing humanity. Well, in the report itself, it's outlining the link between political culture and reconciliation. So part of the importance for political, um, of political culture for reconciliation is that citizens need to feel like leaders are legitimate. Um, this is part of what's needed. They, they're feeling less and less like this is legitimate. And, but we haven't gone further into saying how, how we remedy this. And I want to open up to my colleagues who might have ideas on this. So in, in our society, you know, if, if we're really concerned about cohesion with, within our society and keeping the country together as a unit, you have to look at, at the sort of the horizontal trust that exists between people, between South Africans. Um, and you know, as as we can see from, from, from the data presented that, that we still have a far way to go. Levels of, of mistrust are down, but, but it still remains at, at quite a low level. So what you then need for, for a society to be cohesive is to, to have a very firm and strong sort of vertical sort of relationships and vertical um, power sort of relations and, and to ensure that the institutions that are there, the government or go institutions of governance that are there um, are trusted um, and also have integrity um, because, because they, they are really sort of critical in, in holding a nation together where those bonds on a, on a horizontal level does not always exist. So, so you have to have, for example, um, a, a high level of trust in your legislative institutions, but also your judicial institutions to, to mediate in, in a society which is, which is often very fractured. And very often that also places a lot of stress on these institutions itself. The, 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 the lack of, of horizontal cohesion. But so what, what we've seen sort of since 2006 as we've looked specifically at democratic institutions has been this, this dip in, um, in, in confidence for, for the presidency, national government, local government level, 
um, and also the institutions sort of such as, as the police. Interestingly, the one government institution that, that has uh, received quite a high level of, of trust uh, is the public protector. Um, so so um, I think as far as an advice is concerned, one, one doesn't know how, how, how it will be taken. Or, uh, but but it is, it's really important to, to, to strengthen our Chapter 9 institutions. And those recommendations have been made a number of, of years ago already in the, in the ASMAL report, because these are really the, the institutions that are supposed to, to look after um, our constitutional values. But if one, for example, just looks at, at the funding that, that these institutions receive, um, the public protector constantly struggles to, to, to get a, a budget that she feels to, to, um, is, is sufficient to implement the work. The same with the Human Rights Commission. And these are institutions that are really critical to, to mitigate where, where, um, where these horizontal relations are, are absent. One thing one can do with these stats is to do a cost-benefit analysis of the current presidents of South Africa. And to really, I mean, we, you, you, here you have statistical facts that we think are accurate. What are the cost-benefit analysis of the Zuma presidency for South Africa? I mean, that's, that's the citizen's job to do, and that's the media's job. And, and the drop in, the, you know, in important institutions, the confidence, is a massive cost to South Africa's young and fragile democracy. The other side is, if I were the ANC reading this, one of the statistics that would worry me greatly is if uh, is the trust in national leaders to break it down by racial groups. Now, it's, it doesn't take an Einstein to figure out that you know black South Africa is the main constituency of the ANC. But in 2004, this is on page 19 of your reports, figure 8, 2004, there was a difference between black and white South Africans trust in national leaders. By a, white South Africans had about a 25% trust. Mm. Black South Africans had a nearly 80% trust. So there was a 60% difference. There's actually a consensus developing in the country because black South Africans now, just over 50% of them have trust. So they've dropped from 80 to 50%. This is the ANC's constituents. So, so there's another way to look at this thing and say, you know, there's a cost also to the governing part of what, what's happening. And white South Africans, interestingly, have just hovered, they've gone up a little bit, gone down a little bit, but it stayed fairly stable at the mid-20s. You know, and the other two uh, um, apartheid categories that we use here, as, as Kim explained, have, have um, you know, have hovered in the middle. But, but it's interesting that black South Africans have dropped from 80% to 50%. And I think that is also a major factor in, in how South Africans view. Um, the key question is, can South Africa survive a, black, uh, a bad president? Where I think a majority of South Africans, you know, I, their experience is that there is that lack of political accountability. We've seen it recently with the encounter report and so forth, which is still, you know, quite a contentious issue. And this, this applies across racial groups. And I'm not uh, particularly surprised that on the question around, um, you know, memory, politi um, memory politics, mm -hmm. you know, was apartheid a crime against, unit, um, against humanity that we're seeing a, a drop in those results across racial groups? I think that in the current political climate, mm -hmm. people, you know, because I think people's opinions are also influenced by the political climate, you know, so I think that reflecting on the current politics um, in South Africa, people are beginning to disconnect a little bit with the past narrative and beginning to question that, that narrative, particularly if they might feel that that past is being used for political mm -hmm. agendas or political gains. So I think there is that particular issue where people feel, okay, if this past, you know, if, if, if the, the narrative about the past is being exploited in any form, people become more critical around what the past um, was about and how they choose to remember the past. We know in the past from the black consciousness movement that when there is a lot of racial oppression, one of the strategies is to, in fact, strengthen racial identity because it's a, it's a political act. It's a political act of saying we can't just think about unity, that we're all equal, because that's clearly not what's happening. 
And so these acts, to me, speak to um, a political story around race still matters, and we just can't, we're not just gonna sit back and, and allow what's going on. We're gonna make a statement, we're gonna make a racial statement, because actually, racial statements are being made all the time, but they are normalized, because as we've had a lot of research um, at, at, at the IGR, and one of the things that's come up is the issue of white cultural dominance. That for a lot of black South Africans, they feel um, like the, the dominant culture is still a culture of whiteness, and they have to contend with that every day. For white South Africans, they don't see that because it's normalized, it's just culture for them. So I think the way that the findings speak to it is this increase in racial identity is perhaps an increased statement around race still matters in South Africa and we can't start speaking about unity when inequality is continuing in these very subtle forms. So we're going to speak about it more loudly. That would be my interpretation with the findings, but um, yeah. Thank you very much for bearing with me through those findings. I'm Kim Whale, I'm project leader of the Reconciliation Barometer. I also have a border policy and analysis team who will assist me in fielding questions and interviews. Jan Hofmeyer is the head of our policy and analysis unit. Ayanda Nyoka works alongside me and they've all been a great help as well in helping me to interpret and write up these findings.